we're going to continue on Wednesday nights, aren't we? Y- yes, we can. I'll probably take a break for a little bit, but then we'll, I don't know, what, whatever you guys want to start. Okay. So James. Take a vote. <laughs> Job, let's see how long it takes. The Book of Revelation. James or Luke. <laughs> I'm good with anything. Okay, oh so we're going through chapters 41 through 45. Uh, this is going from the prison, from being a prisoner, to being exalted, to being reconciled with his family. Uh, it's kind of interesting to... A little bit similar path of what Christ had taken, of course. We were caught in prisoners to sin, and he set us free. He was exalted, and we're now reconciled to the Father through Jesus Christ. So... There is a bit of a parallel. We talked about some of these parallels before with Joseph and Christ. Uh, so we'll hopefully see some of those again. Uh, of course, one of the highlights I wanted to point out here is how Joseph gives honor to the Father, or to God, in uh, ver- uh, chapter 41. forty-one, sixteen. it says, And Joseph answered Pharaoh, saying, It is not in me. God shall give Pharaoh an answer of peace. So uh, we're going to see that, I think I've gotten to the last slide, but... Joseph was a prisoner, uh, or excuse me, not a prisoner. He was, from the time he was sold as a slave by his brothers until he reaches this point, he was, that was 13 years. So for 13 years, he was in essence a slave and a prisoner. Uh, And uh, now he's given an opportunity to stand before Pharaoh, and here he is, he's giving God the glory instead of taking the glory upon himself, which kind of really reflects the character of this man who willfully abided in Christ even when he was or in, yeah, in Christ when he was being treated unfairly when he was uh, by his family by his employer <laughs> by uh, the prison it's it, it just amazing to see this man's character uh, but now at this point after 13 years having gone through everything he did separated from his family all of that he is giving the Lord the honor in this instance um, some of people might feel entitled to think, you know, I, I did all that stuff. I, 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 you know, I endured all that affliction. You know, I deserve a little bit of reward, a little bit of respect. But uh, Joseph gave it to the Lord. This reminded me of Daniel. Uh, a similar situation where Daniel, uh, uh, in Daniel's case, of course, he was taken away as a prisoner uh, in the Babylonian captivity. And uh, <clears throat> the, the Nebuchadnezzar had a dream. And Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh tells all his uh, interpreters what the dream was, but Nebuchadnezzar doesn't tell them what his dream was. He actually says, okay, tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me the interpretation of the dream. And, of course, all of uh, Nebuchadnezzar's people, the, uh, what were they called? The Magi is really what they, that was what they were. Uh, they, uh, They were saying, well... Sir, you tell us what the dream was, and then we'll tell you the interpretation. He says, no, you tell me what I dreamed, and then tell me the interpretation. And uh, he was so upset with him, he was about to kill him, and among them was Daniel and his three friends. And uh, Daniel was the one who said, well, hold on a second, let us go before the Lord, and then we'll seek what the Lord says, what your dream was, and then the interpretation of that, and then we'll bring that to you. And over in Daniel 2, 28, it says, but there is... A God in heaven that revealeth secrets and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. They dream in the vision of thy head upon thy bed are these. And, and of course Daniel goes forward and tells him the interpretation of those dreams. Which of course those dreams that uh, Daniel, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had uh, actually feed into the end times of what's even taking place today. But in both cases it was interesting to see that these men who were both, in a sense, prisoners, were exalted to a position that was second to the king or to the pharaoh uh, because of their faithfulness. And it was God who lifted them up because they, too, lifted God up in their lives. So I thought that was interesting. Uh, here, God brings famine, does bring famine. Uh, in Genesis forty-one twenty-eight, it says, This is the thing which I have spoken unto Pharaoh. What God is about to do, he showeth unto Pharaoh. Um, what else did I have here? And this is something that God does do for various reasons. Uh, it can bring famine, pestilence. In 2 Samuel 21, 1, it says, Then there was a famine in the days of David three years. Year after year, and David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord answered, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he slew the Gibeonites. So this famine that was going to come, according to Scripture, is something the Lord was bringing upon that land. 
I don't know, you guys probably don't have a problem with that, but do you guys have an issue with God actually bringing a famine on a land? Because see, one of the obje the reason I'm bringing this up is because in my discussions with non-believers, they have problems with these kinds of statements in Scripture. Of course, they believe it's all mythological anyway, but whenever they criticize Christians and they criticize the Bible, they'll say, see how an evil God you have there. He'll, he'll bring famines, he'll bring pestilence, he'll bring this. Do you guys ever have those kind of thoughts when you're reading through Scripture? Or how do you look at it when you read something like that? I use it. He looks at, he does many things to accomplish his purpose. Yeah. So it all fits yeah. eventually. Like this one here, though, Egypt, he had to bring all those people in there. And then they had their own little portion, and there was this multiplying and multiplying, and they became rich. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of them, too. Yeah, yeah, when we get into next week, yeah, he, he made it, Egypt extremely wealthy. Mm -hmm. and I mean, who are we, though, to question God's actions? Because there's a purpose behind it that we don't necessarily understand at that time. Yeah. So everything that God does is for a reason, and so we can't get angry with Him for what He decides. It's short-sighted just looking at that. You know, yeah. This is what He did, and didn't look either before or beyond it. Yeah. And just we don't know the where the end results. Yeah. Yeah, because this is one of the things that I run into often when talking with them is, like you said, they're short-sighted. They they're really stepping. They're really making these kind of statements because they just want to criticize. So they're looking for anything to criticize a Christian for what they believe. But for us as believers, we need to understand why these things happen. Why do bad things happen to so-called good people? Technically, there is no one good except God. But why do these bad things happen? There's a number of reasons why. My, I guess my take on it for what it's worth is that... Um, a lot of times in scripture we'll see people punished for not repenting over certain things yeah and that is a direct action reaction <coughs> and that fits within the paradigm of justice that we get from scripture because remember our entire concept of justice is based on on scripture and on God yeah. and without that who's to say what's bad or good yeah and so I don't have a problem with that um, I do have a problem with the areas where it does not appear as if the people who were afflicted did anything wrong. And there are some places in Scripture like that. And uh, I, I, I have an absolute belief on that. And my absolute is that a sin is a sin no matter who commits it, according to Luke chapter 20 and in a lot of other places. That includes God. And a lot of people will come up and say, well, God killed a whole bunch of people, but it's okay because he's God. No. According to God himself, it's wrong. So you can't appeal to your own authority to excuse what the authority says is wrong. It's illogical. And so I have a problem with that, um, a big problem with it. So do you think, do you think God sins? No, I do not believe okay. that God sins. I believe that it falls into two categories those that are explainable and those which I do not yet understand. Okay. Um, and there's some places where I look at it and, and I, I see uh, I don't understand why Israel was told to go in and wipe out every man, woman, and child. Yeah. Now some of them are very explainable. Yeah. Some of them are a direct punishment for people that were killing other people. I mean some of them are, are, like I said, they fit into the paradigm of justice. And a few of them I don't understand. That doesn't mean that I believe God sinned. Yeah. It means that there is probably information there that I don't yet understand, and I have to accept it. I think. Whenever that comes up, uh, when, like I said, when I'm talking with other folks that don't believe, they'll say, well, your God commanded people to go in and kill all these children, and then they'll quote a scripture. And I'll say, well, that's not really the best one. The best one's over here where it actually says to kill the toddlers even. Yeah. And they'll say, well, why is that? And I'll take them over to where it says where Abraham was given the promise that he would inherit the land of Canaan, but he said not until the fourth generation. He said God waited until the iniquity of the Amorites was full. Mm -hmm. The Amorites was one of the more was one of the dominant tribes in the region, and oftentimes you can associate one tribe to many tribes, kind of like with Israel. Sometimes Israel represents Israel and Judah, and sometimes Israel just represented the northern kingdom. But in context, I believe he was referring to all those in the land of Canaan. 
and God waited till 400 years until their iniquity was full. And th that phrase refers to God patiently waiting until a certain point when God decides, okay, I have warned them, I have told them to turn away from their sin, they have not listened to me, I have brought in judgment, I have brought in prophets, I have brought in pestilence, whatever. They will not listen to me. Now's the point in which I will bring judgment. And so I think you're, it still fits with what you're talking about. There is, God has justice, but God also has mercy and grace. And His great mercy and grace always precede His judgment. And that phrase where God said, I'm waiting till 400 years, and then He also says the fourth generation. So He waited 400 years for those in the land of Canaan to stop sacrificing their children to the god Molech and uh, some of the other gods that are mentioned. Uh, he waited until they stopped uh, worshiping idols, all kinds of stuff. But they didn't listen. And that's when God sent in Israel. Of course, Israel then later on falls into idolatry. They fall into the same practices that were in the land of Canaan. Then he sends another ungodly nation against Israel, which was Babylon, or Assyria in the north and Babylon in the south. And it's over in Jeremiah 18, I think where he talks about how he, how he deals with all nations. The way in which he dealt with Israel is the same the way in which he deals with all nations. If that nation which I have determined to curse because of their evil, if they turn from that, then I will turn away from my wrath or judgment. But if that nation which I have proposed to bless determines to turn away from me, then I will not bless that nation. I think it... So it's the nation in general rather than the individuals in the nation? It's both. And that's where there's, that's where another debate comes in because I mm -hmm. accept about 95% of that argument until you get to a child who's not yet reached the age of accountability and has, uh, and has not committed any of the sins for which the nation's being judged and all that kind of thing. And at that point, I kind of still accept it on faith that there's things that I don't understand. Yeah. And then... And, and and that's, I think that's what's the key, I think that's the key difference between a true believer and a false believer. A true believer is one that when he approaches scripture, if he sees something that he does not understand, he does not immediately toss it aside. He continues to pray and to seek and ask the Lord for understanding. A false believer is one that sees something that appears to be a contradiction and says, well, I can't believe this anymore, I'm done. And that's, and of course the scripture says that the word is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I think that's one way that the word itself actually determines what kind of person you are. Because you'll read things in here that seem completely contradictory. And it's not until you begin to study the full breadth of scripture with the leading of the Holy Spirit that you then find those connections that didn't make sense before. And we've, the, the, the bulk of scripture the weight of scripture is 99.9% .9 consistent and so the leap of faith that we're asked to make to believe all of scripture is actually very small when put in context against everything else that we know about the character of God yeah it's 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 it is uh, Jeremiah 18 and it's the lesson when they go down to the potter's house and um, he tells uh, Jeremiah to go down to the potter's house and of course he's he says, watch the potter, and of course the potter is making a jar. It becomes marred, so he just tears it apart and then starts again. And then he says, can I not do the same thing? And I think it begins, uh, yeah, verse 6, it says, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? Saith the Lord, behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in mine hand, O house of Israel. At what instance I shall speak concerning the nation and concerning the kingdom, to pluck up and to pull down and to destroy it. If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. And at one instance I shall speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom to build and to plant it. If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good where, wherewith I said I would benefit them. Then he tells them, of course, now go on down to Judah. So with respect to any nation, if, if that nation turns away from evil, then God will stop the judgment that he was sinning against it. But if that nation, which is blessed and says they love the Lord, if they turn from the Lord, then God will cease from blessing first, and then he will proceed to bring in judgment. And so I kind of, you know, I kind of wonder if we've reached that point in our nation. 
it's interesting. There are parallels within Scripture that I see within our nation. We were technically, no, I don't know if it's, you can probably tell this better, at the Jamestown Settlement, 1607, kind of, you know, said this is going to become a nation dedicated to the Lord, that sort of thing. Um, in, in 19, or excuse me, 1864 was President Lincoln. He had uh, called for a fast and prayer because our nation was in civil war. We were divided. We were falling apart. Uh, that was the only time a leader of a nation called or the only time in this country, the last time, I'm sorry, the last time in this country that a president called the nation to fast and repent. Well, Nineveh, when Jonah went in to preach, the, from the leader all the way on down, they repented and they were spared for 150 years. And it's interesting, our 150 years from that time will run out close to the time 14 years after, excuse me, seven years after we would have been 400 years together formed. 1607 to 2007, 1864 to 2014, 150 years. So I've often wondered, have we run out of mercy? I mean, when we see as this nation starts to topple down and down and down, and even Obama said we're no longer a Christian nation. And I think that's that's a... Yeah, we don't care what Obama says, do we? But, I've, uh, but even Mike Baldia, and I was listening to one of his uh, videos, he says that's true, we're no longer a Christian nation. Not like we were when we were formed. There are Christians in this nation, but as a nation, we are not dedicated to the Lord. So anyway, that's a long, <laughs> that was a little bit of a rabbit trail. Uh, but um, I think these kind of things that we see in Scripture can often divide a person between those who really, truly want to know and love the Lord and those who don't, because it's it's almost unfa it's almost it's an anathema. It is anathema to those for God to bring judgment against people when we're so good. And this is the constant conversation I have whenever we get into morality uh, with atheists and agnostics is, you know, you believe in a God that does this, this, and this, and this, and whenever you try to explain that to them, and I'll even equate it to our judicial system. You know, it's like, okay, if your wife was raped and murdered right in front of your eyes, wouldn't you want justice to be brought to that person? Well, yeah, but I wouldn't want them to burn in hell for all eternity. Well. You don't understand the payment, or excuse me, you don't understand the fine against sin. You would want that person who did that to your wife to maybe get the death penalty. That would, in your mind, would bring justice. But the justice that is required to reconcile or to settle sin is complete and total separation from God. Well, either you take the payment that Christ made, or you pay it yourself. I don't know. So anyway. That was all a wonderful rabbit trail. Anyway, uh, but anyway, moving on. Uh, anybody else have anything else to say? I'm sorry, I'm kind of starting to roll along here. But uh, can you pronounce that name for me? Yeah, Zana Something, something. Yeah, something, something. Ah, ah. Mecca like a high, Mecca honey ho. Uh, in Genesis 41 45, it says, and, and Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphanapana. Yeah. And he gave him to wife at Asenath, <laughs> the daughter of He must Potiphar. have not liked him that well. Potiphar. I knew Zap for short. <laughs> Zappa. Priest of On. And Joseph went <laughs> down over on the beach. Uh, anyway, here we see an example of here that Joseph, of course, being exalted to the, the second position in the kingdom. And he, at that time, he's given a Gentile bride. Of course, when Jesus is exalted at his return, he too will take himself a Gentile bride, the church. Gentile just means nations. So he will take a bride out of all the nations when he is exalted in that day. So, interesting parallel there. But, but that's uh, when the individuals of those nations that were judged against... Uh -huh might get their, I guess, um, good stuff, it judges individuals in that way? Well, there is the, um, there is the, uh, uh, the great white throne judgment, well, let me back up. Um, where do you start on this one? <laughs> the beginning, <laughs> Or we, we, we can just wait until we get... No, but we, those who do not die in Christ, at his return, of course, they're cast into hell. There's the millennial period, and then they are resurrected, and they are judged, and then they are cast into the lake of fire, which is called the second death. 
we will be judged at a great white throne judgment, not for whether or not we believed in Christ. It's not an issue of salvation. It's an issue of, of reward. It's, it's what did we do on this earth that God asked us to do. And there's an examples of that in Scripture where it, it talks about works that will be cast into the fire. Some is of gold and precious metals and others is hay, wood, and stubble. And it'll be judged by fire. In other words, whatever's left is, is bears witness. But you can have everything burn up but still not lose your salvation. So yes, there is a judgment that is coming for us. Even the Apostle Paul trembled at that thought that there will be a judgment that we will have to stand before Christ. And uh, Michael Dia, he had said, he was talking about one of his blogs. He says that he does not want to come to the Lord with empty hands. There's that parable that talks about the talents that the, the master had given, you know, each one, and they went out and invested it, and they came back with more. And there was the one who just buried it. He didn't even give it to the to the to the bankers to to draw interest. And of course, he was cast out. But the idea is God gives us gifts. He gives each one of us gifts in the church. And we are to take those gifts and invest them into the kingdom. That is by through witnessing, through sharing the gospel. Because the only thing, there's only two things we can take with us to heaven. That's souls and the word of God. Everything else is perishable. So what Mike was saying, and I agree, and it, I think it agrees with scripture. We don't want to come before the Lord with empty hands. We don't want to have that life where we just got by where we just squeaked by, got into the kingdom by the, the, you know, just by the inch. We want to walk in with knowing that we serve the Lord, not to gain salvation, not to keep salvation, but because he's done so much for us, why can't we just do the same for him? So, but yes, there will be some kind of rewards. Um, I'm not exactly sure. It does kind of describe some of those rewards, but, um, but yeah. But I'd rather not enter in with empty hands, if I can. So anyway, does that answer your question? Someone, yeah. What's what was another? What was another? Well, we earlier we were talking about when God, uh, God judges a nation, okay. even some maybe innocent people get destroyed. And is that if it was that at this point, those the innocents, you know, coming before? Yeah. God that gets their redemption, I guess. Well, when Christ... Re are you I talking about that's, when Christ returns? I think it's a bold assumption. Or just I think the question itself is a bold assumption. In this yeah. case, I, I'm not speaking overall, but I think in this case, it's, it's specifically like um, the one that you showed in like Second Samuel or something. I think it's kind of a bold assumption because we specifically had instances in the old... First of all, everything that we're reading is... A summary. We're not. I mean, you're not getting the word-for-word -word dialogue of everything that people said their entire lives. You're getting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's been passed down. It's been translated. You're getting a summary. Number one. So, in a sense, everything you're looking at, you're almost judging from an armchair. In a sense, you know what I mean. No, I mean it's no, not no, like we weren't. Wait, we weren't. We weren't there. We didn't know these people. We don't know exactly. You know, the Bill Smith who lived in whatever city that was in was an innocent guy who got destroyed. We don't know that. Oh. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I think so. And and, I, and we have instances where we know I th was it who was was it Abraham or Moses that asked about Sodom and Gomorrah if he could find like Abraham. It, it was like five hundred, then fifty, then yeah. ten. Yeah. I mean, we had instances that these. I mean, it's obvious that even at that time, the prophets back then they were well aware of hey, if there's innocent people here, you're not going to destroy them, right? They were asking that question back then too. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like. Uh, because I've wondered about that question too. Did he just nuke all the innocent people? And I feel like asking that question is a little bit of an assumption on my part because I wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And these people have already showed capability of looking at whatever city it is God's going to destroy and saying, well, hey, there's innocent people in there. You're not going to kill them too, right? Which, in which case, I would go to what you said of there's probably something in there I don't know because mm -hmm. I don't believe mm -hmm. that God would just let you go in and, and basically slaughter a baby for no reason at all, no matter what the situation was. Um, to me, there's, and I feel like there's too much of a disconnect between me and what I'm reading to be able to just go, oh, okay, here's the answer. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I can accept, you know, we don't know. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, I, I just get curious on st stuff, some well, like, stuff. And was that, yeah, I'd like to build my faith by knowing a little more sometimes. Yeah, yeah. but, but, but no, I, I can but accept I, we don't know exactly. I, build, I think that I think 
that that question, I want to make sure I word this right, I think that the question we are asking asks about like a principle. Like, God is not going to kill innocent people. God himself is not going to sin. Well, that's asking about God's principles in a sense. And the answer, I think, lies in the actual physical details, which we can go and study. Does that make sense? Yeah, uh, I, I think I follow most of it. Um, in, in another uh, area that I have that's that I have a hard time with is when we say, well, yeah, but for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, and so these people, you know, everybody's guilty of something anyway. Yeah, but if you're going to speak in spiritual terms, we have to accept that unsaved people will suffer their judgment in the next life. But that's not what we're talking about. They were killed and punished in this life. That's a completely different ball of wax. And so, you know, sometimes I, I have uh, questions about that too. But still. So uh, what do you guys think about, like... Um like during the well, even today, but let's say back in the time of Rome when uh, they were persecuting Christians, hanging them up on stakes, burning them. Obviously, these people were faithful people, even to the point of death. What do you think of when you think, why did God let that happen? Well, uh, those people chose to stay, didn't they? The majority of them. I mean, yeah. but I think your point is these were innocent people these that were died. Innocent. Well. I don't know. I'm going to take to task the term we're saying innocent people yeah. because none of us are innocent. Yeah. But I get what you're saying yeah. on that. Yeah. None of us are innocent. Um, but yeah, I mean, some of it I think is, is judgment, but God's allowing all of us to die, whether that's because he's directly calling somebody to go and to, and to kill these people. But I think there's the huge step of faith as well. I mean... There's a lot of area in there that is not this completely is, understood. Because this is something that, like, even Pastor Ken was talking about. These are some of the things we're going to have to start thinking about and facing. The, we haven't experienced persecution like our brothers and sisters do today. But we probably will start to experience that sometime in our life. So is God going to allow torture and torment to come upon us because we're His? Or are we exempt from that because there's a huge segment of the church that believes we're going to get out of here we're going to preach pre-trib rapture we're gone we're not going to experience anything whatsoever we're out of here but there's a lot of christians today that you know it's, are experiencing this right now like we said you know like like even in china you know uh they have to go underground to, to because of their faith so i don't know what do you guys think what uh, to me, that is, that does not require an explanation because I feel like there is already a very thorough explanation for it, and uh, uh, there will be I, uh, probably very few people that agree with me on this. Um, but Second Samuel chapter, a, 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 all the instances you're talking about, the Chris, Christians killed in Rome. Why? Why in the world did that happen? They were killed by the government. Uh, you know, uh, people right now in foreign countries, they have to go underground. Underground from who? Yeah, no. Well, from, well, no, let's be specific. Who? From government. In every single case without exception. The Reed Fox's Book of Martyrs. Yeah. They weren't killed by their by their Aunt Molly who took a hash and went nuts on them. They were killed by government. Second Samuel chapter 8 told us exactly what government would do once human government was established. And so I don't find that a challenge to, to me where, like, like you said, you know, this, this is challenge your belief system. Well, in some cases it does, but the specific examples that you spoke of don't at all. Anybody that reads Second Samuel chapter 8, you knew it was coming. The moment human government was established, it does what it does best, and that's kill and steal. So, but I think that that asks, uh, I think that the question he's asking I think you can take it one step deeper in any case that you have listed. The, those Christians stayed in Rome, and they didn't have to. Not maybe now maybe some of them couldn't leave, but they stayed. Mm -hmm. Those people stayed in their homes and they didn't leave. They 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 weren't trying to leave. And it's like the missionaries that go into countries the day that uh, where where uh, you know you can't bring a Bible in what or whatever. That's a conscious decision, and I think that those people have asked the question which. 
I think, and, and I think that the answer to the question I'm about to say is the answer to your question of, okay, well, what if we face this persecution? I think those people have kind of looked at it and said, well, what if this life isn't all there is? What if this is a very small part of my eternal life? And it forces you to reconsider, okay, is it really worth me leaving in the country so that I can, you know, make sure I've got enough food and a warm bed every night? Or do I need to do what's right and stay here and continue to witnessing pe to people in a country that's basically trying to push God out? I mean, in, 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 in light of eternity, it's absolutely the second decision. And I think those people looked at their eternal destiny, not just, you know, the next 60 years, but their eternal destiny. And said, no, the right thing for me to do is what's listed in Scripture and to stay here and to witness no matter what the cost is. And regardless of who's persecuting you, and, and I think that regardless of who's persecuting you, you need to be able to answer that question. Yeah. And I think that that's the best possible question that you can ask Christians today. Yeah. I think that's the best possible question to ask them because if you re when it really comes time time to you know follow where the curve is going and follow where it's going to be comfortable and follow where you can go get you know a, a reliable job and a house or say hey you know me and my family are it's like what Joshua said I think it was where he said choose who you're going to follow but we're yeah. going to follow the Lord. today well in my in my family and I mean it's like to say it is really really simple mm -hmm. but to live it out isn't. Yeah. You know, it's not. It's tough. You don't know where your next meal is going to come from. You don't know if somebody's going to arrest you, black bag you, and end up killing you in the long run. You don't know what's going to happen. But I think it's an important question to ask, especially nowadays, especially, like you said, with our fall from grace. Yeah. What? Well, not only that, but when you think, because when I'm reading the, the Tortured for Christ and the Fox's Book of Martyrs, and when you look at it, these people, like he said, they're making a conscious decision to stay with Christ. And not only that but there being somewhat a picture of Christ by taking that abuse and and not recanting or or saying no I'm the one that made a mistake let me live they're showing no I am dying for my savior because he died for me and not only that but they're bringing other people to Christ through their torture and and through all of the craziness they know I have my place in heaven but there's someone out there that doesn't. And if I take my beating the way that God took his for us, I might be saving a life by giving up mine for Christ. And I think that's something that we all need to look at from the bigger picture that we know where we're going, but we need to also make sure that we know where someone else is going because that's the big picture for Christ. Because yeah. that changes your perspective. If you think of like in the nowadays, nowadays terms of like Paul getting thrown in prison, well, if cops stormed in here, handcuffed you, and threw you threw you in the local prison with whoever else, and you had to stay there after getting you know beat or tased, would you really be staying in prison? Could you? Yeah. I mean, really, for real. And no, it's I mean, most likely with us, it's not going to happen. But I mean, I think that the answer the the answer to that question kind of seems like what we're discussing. Could you really do that? You know? Yeah. Well, yeah, and you, you, I think that that's a question that all Christians have to come to that point. And it rolls back around to why would God allow that to happen? I think it's what, what Sydney was hitting on is that we are witnesses for Christ. We have been bought and paid for with a price, and we no longer belong to ourselves. We belong to Him. And so if He wants to use us as a martyr, and the word martyr means witness. So if He wants to use us as a martyr, if our life brings 20 other people to Christ, then so be it. Because in the, in the realm of eternity, this life is, as the Bible says, is but a vapor. We're here and gone in a second. But if our life can be used as a witness and a testimony to bring other people to Christ, then so be it. And that's why I like apologetics, because I personally believe that whether it's your faith being demonstrated through martyrdom, through uh, standing up against people who are, are con constantly condemning you, but you are not condemning them, uh, these are all witnesses and all evidences that point back to that God is who he claims to be. You know, it's, it's, it, I think that these kinds of things, whether it's martyrdom, whether it's apologetics, whether it's some other stuff we're going to talk about, uh, they all bear witness to Christ that he is exactly who he claims to be. And uh, I think we do need to come to that place in our life, in our Christian walk, that we decide we are not going to turn away whatsoever under any circumstance at all from Christ and I think we will be faced with that in our lifetime I honestly do I, I wish it wasn't the case but I think we will based upon the time we are in history of course Christ told us to watch to look to see the times we're in uh, 
of course, a lot of people have said, well, you know, we've always said that, you know, every, every generation has thought they were the last generation, but we have a lot going for us that they didn't have. We have Israel back in the land, as promised. We have the period in history where we are, 6,000 years from the beginning, as even our ancient fathers and rabbis talked about. They thought that we had 6,000 years to govern ourselves. And then at the end of that millennium, before the beginning of the seventh millennium, is when Christ would return. So there's a lot of things that are taking place. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, but since I've been talking to Ken, and I've, of course you guys saw Mike Baldia when he came to speak, or those who did, uh, he's of that same opinion. Um, so I think we will be facing this kind of stuff, and maybe sooner than what we hope. Oh, thought on that for what it's worth. I think we may escape in this country. And the reason why I think we may escape it is because that the American church, again, where from whence does oppression come? Well, it only comes from one direction. Martyrs are killed by government. The American church has become so compliant that I think it may happen somewhere else, but I don't see it happening here because the, the church has almost become an outgrowth of the state hmm. uh, in, in a lot of ways, I think. Well, that's kind of like a black hope, isn't it? <laughs> I don't... I See, I don't, I don't necessarily yeah. agree with that. Like because I think there will be... I think, but you where know, would just the, true the term Christian of go? it's going to separate the men from the boys. It's going to separate, basically, your true believers and those that are going to stand for their faith. Because China and does... And those that are going to be compliant and go along. Because China does have... Uh, an official Christian church, sure, and people go to that. And, yeah. But those who love the Lord have pulled out of that, mm. and they're no longer a part of it. Same thing when when and uh, they're the only ones that will come under persecution yeah. because they're the only ones standing, not for God, but against the state. And as long as remember, yeah, it's, it's this, this is an important this is an important thing to understand. The state doesn't care if you worship God or not. As long as you accept the licensing, get your 501c3, pay your tribute when you're told to pay your tribute, and teach your congregation to submit and obey. You can teach pretty much anything you want as long as you fall into that category. See, when I, the, there's a book that she's gonna read, I've read it, when Michael <coughs> became his, his grandfather, he just barely mentioned it, uh, was the one who started the ministry, Dimitri Dudeman, and he actually was a Marine in the Romanian military. And his job was to go out onto the Black Sea and to stop ships that were bringing in Bibles. He said it was interesting, the state didn't care about guns as much as you would think. They cared more about the Bible because they knew it changed the heart of a man. And so they were stopping Christians from bringing Bibles in to other Christians because they, they felt it undermined the state. Yeah, exactly. They felt it undermined the state. Yeah. Uh, and, and I think that is unique to communist countries. Well, even in China, they do have a Bible, but they've ripped out the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. They've ripped out several chapters. And I had a friend who actually delivered Bibles into China. Mm -hmm. And he went into one of the uh, uh, state-run churches. And when you go in, they'll give you a Bible, but they'll take it back away from you. But when he was in there, he was looking through and he noticed there was a lot of things ripped out because <laughs> they 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 high, they they overemphasize those passages of scripture that talked about obeying you know the king and all that kind of stuff, but they took out a lot of stuff, yeah. and you could not take that Bible with you. But and the, oh, I'm sorry. I go no, go ahead. You sure? I didn't. I'm sorry. I didn't mean uh, to I just I, I. What am I trying to say? I think that if if. If persecution does come to this country and the churches start to become complicit, I will pull out, not because I'm fighting against the state. I'm pulling out because the state is telling me I can only worship God in a certain way, but my Lord says... True, but no, that, you uh, my, my point was at that time you will be perceived as a threat to the state, yeah, to even them, though that's not your personal motivation. No, that's not my, yeah. And until you are perceived as a threat... The state has no interest in rocking the boat. Yeah. I don't think that it, the, the direction of your... To take our current discussion and tie it into the, your previous question, which was, um, how are we going to handle persecution when it comes because we believe it's coming? 
I agree. And I don't believe that this country is going to handle it as well as even the Christians because we're used to the compliance that we now that the church now shares with the state. That is not to say that whenever persecution comes along from whatever direction it may come, I don't care if it's from the state or from anybody else. I have to think so I can say this right. I don't think it matters which direction the persecution is coming from. I think that you have to react the same no matter what. Yeah. That being able to identify where it's coming from is important, but it's like you said, the trials precede a calling. It didn't matter where it was coming from in Rome. It didn't matter if it was coming from the Romans or anybody else. What they did by simply following what they were supposed to do influenced the rest of Western culture. Yeah. Well, it's interesting that um, some of the worst tormentors um, are Christians, former Christians. In China, when they had the Cultural Revolution and they were teaching a preacher of rapture, they were telling that you will never see tribulation, you'll never see hard times, everything will be, you know, cakes and roses. Uh, when the Cultural Revolution went through, the communists came in, turned everything over, said you can't worship your God anymore. Uh, some, many of the pastors were told to either recant or die. And some of the Christians and the pastors recanted. And then they used those people to then torment those who would not recant their faith. And they said, one person who went through it, they said, that communist officer was brutal. But my pastor was far more brutal when he turned against God. They think the reason why is because they, they followed Christ and now they gave up Christ and for some reason their anger was so much greater because they gave it up but that person remained faithful and they said they were the worst tormentors they had ever experienced was by the hand of the people that they used to worship with so they no longer have any hope yeah they they, not, they and the tormentors up. may not even be able to identify it for that reason but that's the truth of the matter they lost their hope they gave it all up but what? Back to what you were saying, though. It seems like the Lord took us in a different direction. Didn't it? The way that the government <laughs> works, though, is <laughs> what does the government want? The government wants power, <clears throat> and they don't care how they get it, as long as they have power over whatever it is that they're wanting. Yeah, submission. And when you see the way that God works, everything that God stands for the government is completely against because it is full there are good people in the government but then at the same time there are so many people in the government that are so backwards and, and their morals are corrupt and they don't care what they do to get power and when they see us as christians and we're saying hey there's something wrong with your morals and you need to turn it around that's when we become the threat it's not because we're going against the state for political reasons it's when we're going against the state because we are godly people and we know what god wants of us that's, and that's why they hate Sorry. us i agree completely i just don't see a church uh, the, the the american church doing that that's one of the things that uh, she said that it reminded me of mike's vlog when he was he, he used to live under a communist regime he learned you know his family lived under it he said the thing about the communist government or the state government that he was under, the reason why they really hated Christians is because they had hope. Because they they obeyed something higher than the state, and the state hated that. They hated the idea that they had hope outside of what they were providing. And he says that was the greatest threat to their, to their rule, is that they were not the end of that person's desires. It was God who was much higher. And so they saw that their power was being usurped by something they couldn't control. So if they could stop them from worshiping God, stop them from believing in Christ, that then made them think they had control. And he said, I thought that was just, that was so neat to hear him say that because I never thought about it that way. But that's what the state wants, is they want everybody to look to them for everything. Listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected. They have rejected me. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's the point. That is the whole point. That's the point. It's submit and obey. Submit and obey. Yeah, and I think yeah. that, uh, yeah, that when you fail to do that and you start looking to another authority, at that point you become an enemy of the state. Yeah. And so that's, that's kind of what I was getting at. I'm not willfully rejecting the state, even though that's what they would see. Mm -hmm. I am saying I am going with God and not with you. You have now, in essence, they have now broken a higher command. When they have made their laws to tell me I cannot worship my God, 
they have broken God's laws. So when I am not following their rules anymore, it's not because I'm rebelling against them, it's because they are rebelling against God, and I am remaining faithful to the Lord. So when, I, when they tell me, do not worship, do not read your scripture, and they make that a law, they have broken God's law already. So when I read scripture and I worship the Lord, I'm not breaking any law because they have usurped God's position, which they should not do. Yeah, I, I, but I, I guess my point is I, I don't see that happening in this country because the state has become a lot more pragmatic than it used to be. Mm -hmm. uh, now it is seen as very inefficient. And the, really the Romans had this right in, uh, in, in scriptural times. They didn't want to crush the Jewish church. Now they didn't. They were occupying Israel. They could care less mm -hmm. what you taught or what you believed. What I want to know is: Are you teaching your congregation that we are the authority? Are you teaching your congregation that you are to pay your taxes to us? Yeah, that's what the state. Are wants. you teaching? Yeah, that's what the state wants. That's what if Richard Wormbrand that, said. If you've got your 501c3, if you're government licensed, if you're obeying all their rules, if you're teaching the people in your congregation to obey all their rules, you can teach Satanism, you can teach Buddhism, you can teach Christianity, and you can use any book you want to do it. Yeah, that's what Richard Wormbrandt said when they went, he and a whole bunch of other pastors went to this con Richard Wormbrandt was the founder of Voice of the Martyrs. Oh. He, when he was in Romania, the, the communists came in. He went to this conference where the communists came in, and they wanted all the pastors to say how great and wonderful the communism was. And uh, I think her name was Rabina, uh, Richard's wife. She said, get up there and tell him to stop spitting on Jesus. And when he went up there and he said that this government is not the authority in our lives, it is God, he, he immediately made himself an enemy of the state. That's when you got problems. That's when he became imprisoned for 16 plus years combined, tortured, beaten, brutalized because he stayed with Christ instead of going with the state. I think it's important, though, that the people that we're talking about, it's all based upon the pretense that they studied the people on the right. The, the unspoken thing here is that they all studied the Bible enough to actually know when they were separating from the state. Yeah. And that's why I said mm -hmm. where your persecution comes from is really, you need to know, but it really doesn't really, it doesn't, I don't care if who's persecuting me is my own government or some guy who lives over in Zimbabwe. Yeah. If he's persecuting me, he's persecuting me. And I think that, that you're, uh, what you said about, you know, the, the, the church's compliance with the state nowadays, it may happen, it may not happen, but I don't think it depends on the state. I think it depends on whether or not the Christians are actually sitting back reading their Bible trying to identify it, because right now they're not. Mm -hmm. If you brought this argument up in, in your modern day church, you'd be so unpopular, you wouldn't even be this far in the discussion by now. They can't even ask the question. Um, and I think that you need to be able to study your Bible enough and ask these questions, even the tough questions before you can then go, okay, well, we're doing the right thing in the face of persecution because, and I mean, it's a simple thing to say, okay, study your Bible, but I think it's also a very important principle um, because I don't think a lot of Christians nowadays do it. And I think that's why you look at, we, we're both looking at the same situation of coming persecution. We don't actually, we don't know who, what, or when. And you can look at it and say, hey, I think that a lot of Christians may just sink right, right in along with it. And at the same time, I think that is true too. There will be a lot that will go with it. But at the same time, right now, but at the same time, you today. also see the flip side of the coin yeah. and say, "Hey, for certain people who see what's going wrong, it's going to get really tough." Well, that's because we both sat here and read our Bibles enough to go, "Oh, okay, yeah. here's a question that needs asked." And I think this is, I think this is for, I think God will bring this about for the very purpose of separating those two groups. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> she was, she noticed when she was reading some of the stuff from. Uh, from uh, in Tortured for Christ and, and uh, Fox's, Fox's Book of Martyrs, she right said, there. Dad, those people couldn't sit on the fence. No. You could not sit on the fence in those countries under those situations. You cannot be lukewarm and, you know, be a, be a creaster or, you know, you couldn't. It's you couldn't. crazy. Like the Russians, the, the, he was talking to these Russians and they either go really hard this way or really hard that way. There's no in between for them and that's just amazing that there is no lukewarm for them. It's either they're really freaking hot or really super cold. And that's what even, you know, Christ said to the Laodiceans that uh, them being lukewarm made them sick, made them want to vomit them out of their mouth. He said, I'd rather you be hot or cold. And I think that what is coming upon us is for part of that purpose, has many purposes, but one of those purposes is to separate the sheep and the goats. 
is to separate those that are truly bought and sold and you know die for him to those who are just sitting on in playing church and I think that makes those situations make those makes that very clear and so I think we need to purpose in our hearts that we're going to not compromise we're not going to turn from him of course we won't really know until that event happens but part of that comes about by studying in the Word. Part of that comes about by listening to other Christians and what they went through. That's why I've, I, I've read the Fox Book of Martyrs and all these other books. That's why I've had my kids read them. Uh, is to understand. And that, was, that used to be in England many years ago. The two books that were chained to the pulpit was a Bible and Fox Book of Martyrs. Because they wanted people to understand, look, this is true Christianity. This is really what Christians have to go through. And, and we can't, we can no longer play that lukewarm Christianity like we've been doing in this country. Well, we in our country, can't. I mean, in the early part of the 20th century is when the bottom started to drop out. I mean, if you, as far as moral, being able to be lukewarm goes, I mean, by the time the 50s, 50s and 2000s and that whole span, I mean, it's like our country has gotten perfect and our church has gotten perfect at riding the fence and not offending anybody. Oh, yeah. And now, we're, not, now we're not even riding the fence. We've just bought and we've just gone in lock, stock, and barrel with the world. I mean, if you just take the culture, just the whole, not even the Christian culture, just the U.S. culture, if you take a girl, a teenage girl walking down the mall this summer and put her in the summer in 1955, everybody thinks she's a stripper. Yeah. Seriously. Oh, yeah. Or a prostitute. Oh, they would gosh, seriously yes. think that. Because, I mean, it's, and, and nobody's going to say anything to any of them because they don't want mm. to offend her. Yeah. Mm. I mean, the country is perfect at being lukewarm. Yeah. And when you think about it, I think that what people call extreme Christians, the one in, like, Fox's Book of Martyrs that are being persecuted for their faith, but then when you read about the the, the on-the-fence people and the, the ones that are playing church, I feel like their punishment is going to be so much worse as opposed to the people that are really being martyred and... and, and persecuted for their faith we get those rewards but the ones that are playing christian and don't really have christ their time will be only for a season and then it's done and so we can't just sit here and play christian we really need to be like those russians hard this way and not cold that way we can't or be you'll in the be in a group of christians where god at the end times you think you're going to get to heaven and god goes no i never knew you never turn knew. away from me yeah and he's going to be a real hard pill to that. swallow you know, have we not healed in thy name? Have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not cast out demons in thy name? Have any of you ever healed, prophesied, or healed, or cast out demons? I mean, these were these were guys that appeared to be hardcore Christians. And Christ will look at them and say, I never knew you. Yeah. That's a, a little scary. I have an enduring question in my mind. That is, who are those people? Yeah. I mean, exactly. Who are I mean, they? I've thought of what are their beliefs and why are they rejected by God? I have often thought because when I look at TV evangelists and the people that follow them, they they say they heal, they say they prophesy, they say they cast out demons. I've met, I'm sure you've met plenty of those people who say they do all those things. So I've often wondered if those people making those statements, did they really do those things, or were they proclaiming to do those things but never really did them? I, yeah, I don't know. I'm worried a lot about the modern church as a whole. I think that. It wouldn't surprise me if half the Christians in nowadays church end up getting getting that exact message, just because so many of them are Sunday morning Christians. Well, I've heard pa pastors say, if if they tell me to take the mark, I'm going to take it, because God loves me, and you need to feed your family. Did they do that? And I thought, ever? And I thought, like ever? And I thought like ever? wait a minute, you know, now that we have TiVo and all that well, DVR, you can back it up. Like, did he really say that? This is a pastor of a Christian church, of course on television making that kind of statement when the Bible is explicitly clear do not take the mark and he's telling his own congregation take it God loves you and he'll be okay with that wow hello? what Bible are they reading <laughs> really hello wow. I'm sorry you're going to say something oh I was just you know as you guys are talking I'm sitting here thinking you know um, just thinking in terms of you know persecution in, in, in this country um just from the, the mindset that, I mean, that persecution is God, and I, I believe, you know, wholeheartedly that that, that, that is also coming um, because the church in America is so complacent. Um, and even, even what I might look at and think, okay, that's a kind of riding the fence kind of person. Are they saved? Are they not saved? Are they a believer? Are they not? They very well could be a believer. 
but they've kind of adopted the whole, you know, United States Christianity and just fallen into that complacency. And God, in his love and his mercy, is going to force them to make a choice. Yeah. And come face to face with that themselves. And it's like, you know, I'm using you for the kingdom. You're not doing that now. So I'm going to force you to go hard this way rather than just letting you. I mean, I look at that less, I guess, as, you know, his punishment on the United States and more of his mercy and his grace. Well, yeah, he, he chastens those whom he loves. Right. And if you look at Israel, what they went through before they were finally destroyed, God used several different measures to try to get them to repent. So I think, you know, 9-11, economic depression, all this stuff that's coming against us, I think this is God saying, look, open up your eyes, pay attention. I think that is his mercy. He's he's being very patient. You know, he's long-suffering, not willing that any man should perish, but all come to repentance. So I think this period of time that we're in, how long we're going to be in it, I think it's for that very purpose of trying to wake us up, to make a decision, to decide, get off the fence and, and get over with Christ. Because if you don't, you're going to perish. And if you're not, then either A, he's going to show you, you're not really for me. Yeah. And then you're going to go. Yeah. And then you're going to. What scares me is when he leaves you be. I mean, sometimes he, I mean, in the Old Testament, he just nuke, he would nuke a city and he's like, oh, okay, well, that was black and white. Or like you said, Fox is a book of Marcus. It's like, eh, that's black and white. Well, what if, what if it's like what my dad said? What if the worst punishment you could possibly receive is that he just gave you everything that you wanted? Yeah. That you were complacent. There was the one author I read. He said, I think the worst thing that God does to a nation, just let them leave yeah. them to their devices. Yeah. What if the church did what he said and everybody followed? Yeah. I mean, what if, I mean, what if that's the worst form of punishment? That's what scares me. I think there will be many in the church. And I think we're, it's already been prepared. It's already been made ready by uh, a lot of these people in the health and wealth gospel, the prosperity gospel, the, the faith, whatever they, they want to call it, the faith movement. It's... They've been softened so much to the point that they're not committed whatsoever to Christ. All they're looking to God for is stuff. Yeah. And when the stuff stops flowing, <laughs> then they're gonna then they're gonna go look to the person who's gonna give them stuff. Come on. And that's of course back to the state. Yeah. Like you said. Well, the government will give me this. The government will give me that. We kind of lulled into this false sense of complacency. Well, take a clock now and. I think we did three slides. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's more like it. That's what we're normal. Normal. <laughs> <laughs> two, or three, two or three weeks of moving through See, chapters. We'll put you, you guys were place. threatened with the end, and you thought, no, don't let it in. <laughs> Drag it out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, but I also think that... Uh, speed this up next week, see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> no, but I think this is what's on our minds. It's At least it's on my mind. <clears throat> And uh, that's what I wanted. I want the Holy Spirit to kind of take us in the direction that he wants us to talk about. Of course, we were talking about Joseph and his funny name, but <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, this, is, this, is, this has been on my heart for, I, for a long time now. I think it was back in 2005 when God really shook me up and opened up my eyes. It was about the time that uh, Amanda had gotten sick. And uh, it was also the time that I had discovered Dimitri and Mike and started listening to the, what they had to say and what they felt their message was to this country. And then, of course, I was like, God, have you been talking to this nation for a long time? And then, of course, I was listening to David Wilkerson back when he was saying all his stuff. I'm like, well, God has been talking to this nation for a very long time. And he's been sending men and women into this country, both inside this country and outside coming in, to shake us up and to wake us up. And... And uh, he kind of woke me up a few years ago, and it's it's exciting to see other people waking up to this, uh, because there will be a sifting, you know, like like Jesus said to Peter, Satan wants to sift you, and Jesus didn't say I I'm praying that he'll stop. He said I'm praying that you'll be faithful, and I think that's what the Lord wants us to do is through this whole thing is to be faithful like Joseph. Aha! Found a way to tie it back. <laughs> <laughs> Through through nice whether segue. yeah, <laughs> whether we're you know sold as slaves, whether we're put into prison, uh, whatever conditions we find ourselves in, to constantly and continuously remain faithful to Christ, no matter what happens, and then we'll get a cool name like Zasvanatha Palamahe. I don't even get out of bed unless they refer to me as that. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, the name, according to some of these, according to the Targum, uh, the man to whom mysteries are revealed, but Jerome thinks it means savior of the world, but nobody really knows. I just, uh, but it may mean something to that effect. I'm sure it's a really cool name and it means something very significant, but it's debated. <laughs> well, next week, we'll get we'll into... Go to slide four. <laughs> go to slide four. <laughs> We'll get into talking yeah. about could Joseph actually be Imhotep? I saw the mummy returns Imhotep. and he looks nothing like him. <laughs> that I, I just well, thought of Brendan <laughs> Fraser. <laughs> There's some interesting parallels between Imhotep and Joseph. Imhotep was later on, was actually in the beginning was a man, but then he was exalted to the place of a god. But there's a lot of interesting things with respect to the pyramid that was built, the city that was built. In the, in the tomb that they just cannot find for Emoto. So we'll get into that next week if the Lord wants us to. <laughs> Apparently the Lord wanted to, to for us to get into this discussion. This is a good discussion. I'm never going to watch the mummy movies the same after that. <laughs> I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm going against scripture in some way. No, it's, it's interesting. That's this is Joseph. That's not the mummy. <laughs> that's not the mummy. <laughs> And what is that story? But uh, I've kind of I have wanted to talk about these this stuff for years, but wherever I was at, whatever church I found myself in, the pastor was not in a place to talk about it. But now Ken, he's in that place, um, so, so now I get so to talk with. He's happy if he offended at least. I didn't one know that was the next people. slide, or I would have, like stop talking at seven thirty. <laughs> and look after that, could Abraham be the Scorpion King? <laughs> <laughs> Not the rock. Who really built the pyramids? Aliens. Aliens. So it was a Transformers. Well, like I said. We just had this whole discussion. Housing. Oh, yeah. technically is aliens. Oh, that was funny. I've been in it, and there's no aliens there. Well, no, because they flew back to their home planet. Watch Transformers. They're yeah. good at sweeping. No, you got to watch Stargate. It's a docking station. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Transformers. For a giant iPod. <laughs> and they're going to play terrible Justin Bieber music. <laughs> no, that's reserved for the Lake of Fire. <laughs> Alrighty. I've never heard Justin Bieber. You're never blessed. Be. Just never say never. <laughs> well, oh, you're up to now. I've never heard a Justin Bieber song. You'll That's one of his songs. Fight never never forever. Forever. We win. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Well, we'll begin here next week. <laughs> Slide two. And we're not. It's not the end. So <laughs> next week is not the end. So. Uh, okay. Uh, anything else? Anybody want to bring up? We heard. No. no, pray before you get us on another soapbox. Hurry. Uh, 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 I'll be here next Wednesday, the day after Christmas. I'm out of town, and I don't know if any of my colleagues would be here to let you in. So I was going to actually up. say if we'll take that last week off, if yeah. that's okay with everybody for you know family yeah. and all, because there's a lot of activity. So the, the week th after that, I'm not working, but I can be here at this time. Is that the day after New Year's? Yeah. That's, We'll yeah, sober up from our three day drunk and come study the Bible. Well, it's the 21st. Oh, man. Doesn't yeah. follow us, <laughs> and on that topic of church deformness. <laughs> uh, hey, you, you, you can it's bring the hair of the dog purpose. with you <laughs> and uh, have a beer here. If it's legal. Care. What's legal? Drinking. Oh, yeah. If it's legal, we can it do it. It must be right. right. And it isn't right. illegal it's until you get caught. So it's okay. So. Yeah. But uh, yeah, next week will be the last week of this year, and then we'll start back. We'll skip a week and then start it again. Okay. So, so I will and next ready. week will not be the last one, apparently, because we're not there yet. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I could move a little quicker. Oh, well, you could have if you were alone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So bring duct tape next time, so we can just. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, would somebody like to volunteer and close us out in prayer? Thanks, Sydney. I knew that was going to happen. <laughs> Psychic. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I'd like to thank you for this wonderful discussion that we had, Lord, and I pray that um, what has been said here tonight, that it'll we'll all take away um, something from what Dad has taught and um, from what everyone else had said, Lord, and, and use it in our daily lives and, and apply it in our hearts and minds, Lord. I pray that you will protect all of us as we are going throughout this Christmas and New Year's season when all the crazies come out. And I pray, Lord, that we will all have a good day and that we'll... Um, Travel back home safely, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Amen.
Well, thank you. Thanks, thank Jeff. You.